Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lance Butler. I'm soon going to be Anne Traherne's successor as chairman of the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre. And you're all very welcome to this first talk. Actually, it's a film of me talking to somebody else. So well, I hope you enjoy it. Um, uh, the first of our autumn series of Tuesday talks, just so that everyone's in the picture. Perhaps you realize that the Tuesday talks used to be once a month. And since the golden lining of COVID has been that we've had to go on to Zoom, we've had a lot of people coming to our Zooms and wanting these talks. And we've now put it up to um, every, every week. So the Tuesday talks are every week under the, think, I think, wonderful slogan, I didn't invent it, open minds, open minds. Um, this is the first in the series. Uh, it'll go on till December. We'll then stop for Christmas and the New Year, like everybody else. And we will end up uh, in January. And we will then start again with Tuesday Talks. And we've got quite a number of stars, um, both before Christmas and after. And I really hope that you all feel that you would like to join in, because I think we have some offerings of considerable interest. Um, our aim is, of course, to discuss the spiritual and the paranormal and in particular to give it a bit of a fair wind because although there are many many questions that we all have in that area it is the cinderella in research and and thinking and philosophy less of a cinderella now but the cinderella um, compared with the enormous enormous and wonderful efforts that are put into mainstream mainstream scientific and psychological and other such research so you know i really hope that you know, these talks help to, you know, redress the balance, as does everything that happens at the um, Arthur Conan Doyle Center, and much of which is happening, as you know, um, online. Um, tonight's going to be a slightly more personal talk. Um, it's a film, a professionally made film, so it may have slightly better quality than the usual Zoom talks, but it's, um, it's Charlie McLean, the great whiskey, whiskey expert, and myself um, discussing spirits on spirits. Um, before I hand you over to, to me and to, to him. Um, I would like to say that next week, the Tuesday talk is the great, as people say on these occasions, the great Rupert Sheldrake, one of the most important scientists who have their minds open in our direction, as well as in the direction of mainstream science. And the great thing about Zoom is you don't have to rush to buy tickets because it's not like when we have people in the center speaking to a, in a room where they can, we can only accommodate 40 or 50 people or 90 if we go to the big room upstairs on Zoom, you can all come. And I hope you really will enjoy Rupert Sheldrake next week and all of the Tuesday talks between now and Christmas and join us again in, in January. So without more ado, um, I would ask uh, my colleague to switch on the film and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Charlie, so, what are we what are we going to have here, dear boy? Well, we've got this. In fact, is a twenty eight year old Aberfeldy. Aberfeldy is a Highland whisky, uh, malt whisky. You see, it's it's really quite pale, mm. and that m means that it's been filled into a cask which has been used before. And if you're going to leave it in for twenty eight years, you don't want a, a fresh cask. You don't want a first fill cask, as we call them, um, because otherwise, the flavour of the whisky would be dominated by. Uh, Flavors coming from the wood. From the wood, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice also that it's very slightly opaque, The because um, mm. we've added water, and that is actually a good sign, because it means that it has not been chill filtered. Chill filtration would take out these things. They're, they're little chemicals, they're called mm. long-chain fatty esters, or lipids. Oh, um, I thought they were going to be bad for and, me. Uh, no, on the contrary. Oh. And, but they're mighty contributors, particularly to texture. And when, you t when we taste this, it's got a wonderful well, for me, you correct me, but the uh, candle wax, it's, it's what we would say mm. teeth coating. Mm, 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 it's a, mm, a marvellous mm, whiskey. So, Sancha. Sancha. You notice that? Sweet. Yes, I do. Yes, slightly very acidic. sweet. Yes, lovely. It's gorgeous. Mm. And then that candle wax comes in mm. back at the end. Yes, you're right. And, it's, and, it's and those are the lipids, are they? Those are yes, the lipids. Yes. Mm. 
And that's the kind of fat that isn't bad for me, mm. you're telling mm. me. Oh, no, you? that's very good. This mm. is really, really nice, dear boy. Now, you do know that I'm here so that we can, over these spirits, discuss the other kind of spirits that we're so interested in at the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre. And I, I know you have a few stories, and I, I have a few stories to tell as well. So who's going to go first? I would rather you set me off. OK. Well, I mean, I'm not very psychic, but I'm very keen on things spiritual, and I'm always looking. Uh, but when I look back on my life, I have actually had more spiritual or paranormal experiences than I really thought I had had. Um, and it began at the age of 10, when I was lying in bed in my parents' house in Shropshire. And I was sleeping in a downstairs bedroom. And because I was scared of the dark, they always used to leave my bedroom door open and a light on in the hall outside. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and there at the foot of my bed was my father. He was in his, he was a gunner officer. He was in his best patrols, you know, his best sort of mess dress uniform for evening wear. He was looking handsome. He had more hair in the vision I had of him than he had in real life. And he was the right size. And he was doing something which was quite rare in those days, which was smiling at me. So I was rather taken by this and rather pleased to see him. And he was against the wall at the foot of my bed. He appeared there slowly, and then he was a complete person. But he was no longer still alive? No, he was sleeping in the bedroom next door. How interesting. So at the time, I just thought I was having a bit of a fantasy. Well, I was. I think I was having what they call um, a phantasm of the living. Because he appeared there, he moved to the right, and he came down between my bed and the wall. And when he came right next to me, he smiled at me again, and I said, Pa? And he kept his smile on and walked through the wall and disappeared. Disappeared. And I was uh, aware throughout this that I could hear him snoring next door. Now, he was younger, which often happens with spiritual apparitions and in near-death experiences. And when you meet your relatives on the other side, they appear younger. They appear to be their best because they're projecting their best towards you. He looked more friendly, more involved in love, which is what they always say is the you know, characteristic of the other side. And it was definitely he, and I've never forgotten it. And I could probably describe it 60 years later, 64 years later, to the finest detail. Mm. Uh, it must have been something paranormal, I felt. What an extraordinary story. And this, but this is not unique, by any means. This no, is very a... much not. And I mean, as we go on, I'm going to be telling you a few more stories oh, like that. I, okay. so. I mean, you know, it's the multitude of them which gradually made me realise that there really must be something in all this. Well, that, that's my start with the first whisky. Well, the only thing that that reminds me of, and I don't know if I've ever told you this story, Lance, the, uh, uh, my, I once had a strange experience, a very trivial strange experience. Um, on the Isle of Arran in Kildonan, and the, which we'll, I'll return to later. Mm. This is where, where, where I was sort of brought up. And um, we were in a boathouse, and the, the, the boathouse was owned by the, the, the local hotel. And the staff in the hotel were all getting very concerned because they, they thought they'd seen a ghost in the, on the, 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 the second floor, or rather the, the first, first floor. And so none of the, 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 the wee lasses would go, up, would go up and turn the beds and what have you. Um, so the, the son of the owner of the toll was a very good friend of mine. Um, he decided that we should have, have a, a Ouija board thing to, to try and find out. But it was supposed to be a, a former owner of the toll, a chap called Duncan Brown. And the, um, so we were in this boat, boathouse, which he used as a sort of recording studio come performance um, area. It was very, very basic, but there was a stage and there were some steps, wooden steps going up to the stage. And in the corner of the steps and the stage were a number of chairs. And we set up the, the table in the middle. The Ouija board for the, a seance. The, the Ouija board yeah. for, for a seance, yeah. And um, I mean, I, I had done a, a, a couple of seances at school, but the, uh, you know, the glass was hardly, hardly moving. It wasn't at all convincing. Mm -hmm. But I was sitting out, as a matter of fact, and beside, beside another person and the... Uh, she suddenly, and it was dim, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't pitch dark, but it was, it was dim lights. And she suddenly grabbed me by the hand and said, there's, there's, there's somebody in the corner, somebody in the corner. And um, so we all, we all started peering into the corner and we could see nothing. And, uh, and then I took her by the hand and, um, and, and moved towards the, the corner where the chairs were. 
And I said, describe exactly what you can see. And so we were all, you know, keenly looking into the gloom. And, and I was, of course, beside her. And I, she, she said, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, eight chairs. And uh, on the second chair from the left, there is the figure of a man. I said, yep, eight chairs, but I don't see any figure. Uh, what does he look like? Well, I can't see his face. He's wearing what looks like an, an oilskin coat and he's, he's got a flat tweed hat. And we were all, I said, let's go a bit further forward. And she was really scared. She was straining back, you know. And um, so we went forward. Then she suddenly went completely limp and said, he's gone. Whew, wow, yeah, yeah. So, so we, we abandoned the, the seance and uh, went up to our cottage, our house, um, just, which was just up the beach. Um, for coffee and things, and the uh, and I held back with my friend Nick Ash, who was the when was, was locking up, and as we locked up, um, uh, he said to me, um, "How many chairs were there?" I said, "There were eight chairs because we all counted them." He said, "There's only seven. <laughs> oh, he'd been stacking them or putting them away. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. There were only seven. We, 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 we had, every, everybody there was five. There were seven people there, mm. and when there was five round the, round the, the, the table, and, and this girl Heather Pepper and myself sitting out, and we, everyone was concentrating and counting the chairs, and we counted eight chairs. But he said there's only seven, because he knew it was his, it was his uh, boathouse. Of course, of course. <laughs> That's pretty nice, isn't it? So nothing came up on the Ouija board? No, no. no. Pe people are always a bit doubtful about the Ouija board, Z although it is true that normally, at teenagers who play with them, well, quite often, that they get something. I mean, did you have a story about people being expelled from school? Oh, from that was a down, that was a downside. Downside, school. that's right. They had a bit of a problem, didn't they? I wasn't I wasn't there, but I, I, I heard the story from two people who had mm. been there. One was fairly senior. The the, 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 the boys involved were um, very senior. They were kind of prefects and captains of rugby and what have you. And um, they were in what would seem to have been a sort of prefect's sitting room. Mm. And it had a big, a big heavy table, big heavy table. And they were, as you know, Downside is a, is a Roman Catholic uh, abbey, mm. and the, um, um, so they were, they were, they were, they were playing, playing with, with the Ouija board, and um, things started to go badly wrong. First, there was sort of static fire started running up and down the the, the curtains of this room, and by this time they were t they were seriously terrified, as you can imagine, and the, uh, and then the next thing was that this big heavy table went rocketing up and wow. it hit the ceiling. It left an, an impression uh, on, on the ceiling and then came crashing down. By this time, the, the, the boys involved had all passed out. The, one, of, one of my informants, who was a very junior boy at the school at the time, um, the, all the kids in the dormitory above were, were woken up. Um, I mean, immediately. By the table hitting by their the table floor? hitting their, their floor. I mean, rocked it. I mean, in wow. fact, I'm not sure he didn't say that some were thrown out of the bed. I think that's very difficult to believe. But the, uh, um, and what, what, what happened was that the, certainly these, these the, 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 the boys that had been involved in it were immediately sent home. And every parent was sent a letter by the abbot of Downside um, telling, the, telling them not. They had, they had Jesuits coming in to do exorcisms and God knows what. Wow. Um, and I mean, but they took it very, very seriously. Mm. And it, it was something that just went wrong, badly mm. wrong. Mm. So, you know, the... Um, well, talking of the, um, mm, Benedictine yeah. school, uh, schools, I was at a Benedictine school myself. And although that didn't ever happen, and we never tried the Ouija on board, um, I had there the first of a series ex of experiences which also turned me on very, very slowly to the spiritual. Because I found that um, I would feel, as everybody does, a kind of reluctance to get up in the morning, especially when you're being got up at 7 a.m. to go to Mass in a cold church, you know. But one morning, I woke up a little early, which is unusual, before the housemaster came in with a bell to ring and get us all up. And I realised I was feeling exceptionally well. And I started feeling better and better and better. Quite an unusual experience, unless you're taking drugs. But I, I wasn't taking any drugs, I must have been about 16. And I felt so much better that I had the experience of being at one with the universe, in, in, in a golden light, absolutely, totally happy. You were still lying in your I bed? I was still lying in my bed. 
absolutely. In a dorm. In a dorm, mm. surrounded by other boys and so on. Hypnagogic state, you know. But I felt really wonderful, and it lasted about four or five minutes. And this is where the sort of multiplicity, you know, several, several different versions of the same thing begin to make you think. Because much later, I had three such experiences um, when I started taking my daughter to a Catholic. Uh, church on Sundays to see if she would like it, um, although I'm not a believing Catholic anymore. I tried that with her and she liked it a bit and she played the flute in church and it was quite fun, but we stopped doing it. Um, three times in church I had that again, which I thought was quite interesting, so that all sounds quite Catholic. But one day, when I was walking my dogs on King's Park in Stirling, I remember very, very vividly, I brought the dogs back to the car and they were sort of woofing around and sniffing and being reluctant to get into the boot, that sort of usual thing. I was feeling quite relaxed. And suddenly, the whole world went completely golden again. I knew I would never be unhappy again. I knew I would never suffer again. I knew that the world was all right. I knew that God was in his heaven and all was well with the world. And I knew that it would last forever. And it lasted for 10 minutes. Mm. And during those 10 minutes, I was in seventh heaven. So that's five of those things which have happened to me. And, and I mean, again, is that often reported? This well, sort of yes. Of I mean, it's it's known as um, uh, universal consciousness, or um, you know, the, the heavenly moment, or bliss moment, or whatever. And that word bliss comes up a lot in Buddhist meditation, and it's mm -hmm. obviously connected, perhaps, to certain forms of enlightenment. And I do remember. I don't want to keep on talking about the Catholic Church, but I do remember a, a Welsh priest once saying to me, you know, life's bloody hard. He said, life's bloody hard, you know. But when God speaks to you and you hear it. You know, it's like a great kiss, and you never forget it. And I realized that he'd been through the same experience. The church knows them as consolations, because we're all in the desolation, but that's a consolation. Now, I don't think this is a particularly Christian, Catholic, or even religious thing, but I think it's something which does happen to people. And as with near-death mm. experiences, I think it's something which they remember, and they remember vividly for the rest of their life. And they don't believe in X or Y theological proposition, but they believe that they had that experience. And it's extremely hard to say that they didn't, because when you, you, when you know you've been very, very, very happy mm. and you remember it, you can hardly be making it up. Mm. So some sort of explanation is needed. And you know, I think the, the spiritually minded people would attribute it to the presence of the presence of spirits in the world. And I think that's been my search, you know, looking to see if there are spirits in the world. I mean, apart from the ones we're drinking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking of which, I think we should refresh mm. our glasses. Could we possibly try a different whiskey? One which is less, what did you call oh, I'm it? Going to, I'm going to try, this is, um, mm. this is an Isla whiskey. Mm. Also quite pale, so, but not quite as pale as the last one. It's the last one. Practically looked like water, didn't it? And the Talking this is a 20, again 20, 28 years old. Oh, gosh. Um, and it's bottled at 45.8 percent alcohol. Oh. One so, of the alarming so, things about you whiskey specialists is that the more expensive and special the whiskey is, the stronger it tends to be. And I know you've got whiskies in here which are practically 68 <laughs> percent alcohol. Well, they're they're, they're not terribly drinkable. A tip for, for anybody listening, the um, higher strength alcohol holds in flavour better. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's better mm -hmm. to buy at high strength and then add water than to buy at low strength, 40%, um, because the water is added on the bottling line and yes. you're, you're getting a lot of these. There are some compounds found in whiskey where they're called hydrophobic, they don't like water and so they fly away um, volatile. Mm -hmm. and the, um, mm -hmm if you add water on so, the bottling So line. I should buy a really expensive, very no, strong no, no, whiskey not, and dilute not, it. No, no, not necessarily. I think 46 is a good strength, 50. But I mean, th this, this, is, this is, as I say, quite high. So, the, um, so add, add water. Dear boy, uh, this being Isla has that smoky, it peaty... Has, it has indeed. What do you call it? I rather like it. Yeah, it's a little bit like lavatory cleaner. Uh, well, the, the, the chemicals that give this are called phenols, and they, they break down into smoky phenols and medicinal phenols. <laughs> so you're, you're right on both scores. <laughs> the, uh, I'm, I'm getting more smoke now than... than there's a bit of carbolic, actually. It's not, it's yes, not, it's not yes, cleaning products. Yes. Really, um, so you said you, I know you come from Aaron, dear boy. Do they have any whiskey on Aaron? Mm. Not when I was a boy, but the, uh, although there was, in days gone by, there was a lot of illicit distilling. <laughs> yes, of course. And the, um, indeed, Kildon in the South End, where, where, where I was brought up, the, um, 
was it was a hotbed of, of smuggling, smuggling. Illic illicit distilling yeah. and illicit transporting mm. of uh, mm. stuff around the place. But it wasn't there that you had your rather amazing experience of some past lives. It was elsewhere in well, Scotland. Well, no, no, that was a, that was in Iron, and that that was what I was going to tell you about because the um, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. The the um, um, and it, I mean, it, on the face of it, when I tell you the story, it looks like it might be past lives. I'm not sure, but okay. I'll, I'll comment okay. at the end. This was an exercise, and some of the some of the viewers will, will know the name of it. I can't remember what the name is. It's a sort of technique or something like that, and it involves somebody massaging the middle of your forehead mm. and somebody else massaging the soles of your feet. I don't know if somebody, maybe somebody will write in and tell us what it's called. Mm. And we can try it again. We'll try it again. The, uh, yeah. But the, this was when I was at Edinburgh University and, the, um, uh, and a good friend who um, had a flat not far from here, actually. Um, and they had, they, he'd come across this. He, he well, the, the, anyway, he, he, they'd come across as, as, as sort of um, mates in the, there were four of them in the flat. Mm. And they tried it out. And they'd had extraordinary results, you see. And so, knowing that I had a sort of passing interest in these things, the, uh, he phoned me up and said, look, would you, would you be a sort of guinea pig? I'm telling you nothing about it. Nothing. Not nothing about what had happened previously. Mm -hmm. so, so you knew no, nothing no, about it? Absolutely not. So, no preconceptions. And the, um, except he said that all that involved is you know, massaging the forehead and your feet. So, it was a Sunday morning and... Um, they were they were there and the, the the four of them it was in a it was in a bedroom and I was lying on the floor it was a big double bed, and three of them no two of them were on the bed, one was was at was massaging my, my the soles of my feet, and the Felix was was um, asking questions. It was it was it was rather like you know it was rather like it was, it, it was just lying on the floor and it was very comfortable and you know, you know in, in sort of calming and so on and then and, the, and he he would say now. Um, I want you see if you can imagine if you're three feet higher than you really are, and um, so I concentrated for only a, a moment, and the uh, and I imagined myself just in front of the cottage in Iron is the, is a, this beautiful beach, and the and I imagined I was wait, wading out to sea, but rather than going out, the, the water coming up and up. Mm -hmm. um, I was sort of rising above it. That was how I got there. You were walking on the water. That, that, not exactly walking on the yeah, water, yeah. But, but, but you know, the, I was elongating. You know? yeah, yeah. And, the, um, and that was quite amusing. You know? the, the, uh, uh, and then he said, right, now, can you describe your front door? And, um, and so I was still there in, in, in Kildonan, in Iron. And, um, and, and I, could see, I could see the front door as clear as anything. And, and described it with, with an extraordinary detail. You know, and then um, he said, "Go up onto the roof and describe what you can see." And so I rose onto the roof and was looking around. And yes, gosh, you can see so and so from here. You know, God, I can see the such and such. You know, mm -hmm. go go about five hundred feet in the air and drift off in any in any direction you want and describe what you can see as you go. And it was a similar sort of report. The um, of course, from up here you can see the Holy Island, and you can see this, that, and the next thing, and all this sort of stuff. And by that time, you know, I was pretty under. You know what I mean? The, the, and I had to keep thinking the, the, that the only report that the, I mean, they were, I mean, this was going on for some time, and the only, the only thing that the only connection they had with what I was seeing was if I described it. So you had to know? keep talking. So I had to keep talking, but I, it was very difficult because I was so engaged with the, with the, there was lots on the tapes I remember. Just to, wow. Gosh, imagine <laughs> that, you know. The, and then he said, come down wherever and, and report back. So I came down, and, um, and where, where are you coming down? I said, I'm coming down in Knapdale. Now, I didn't know where Knapdale was. I knew that I was coming down the north part of, the, of Kintyre. The, in the Cowl um, mm -hmm. district of Kintyre, the north part. And some distance from Arrow, I mean, oh, yeah, across the yeah, sea. Yeah, yeah, across the, the sea. I, I, I'd missed all that. I hadn't, I hadn't, um, mm -hmm. because, anyway, the, 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 uh, and so I came down there, and there was a guy, m sort of middle-aged, sort of late middle-aged man, 
on, a, a, on a, an, a, an old track, not a farm track, it was like it was a metal track but with grass down in the middle of the road. Mm. Woods on the right hand side, a field falling away on the left hand side. And he had a knapsack on his back and a stick and a hat. And um, I sort of looked at him um, and the thing that, that was the most striking was that he had these funny, sort of slightly archaic boots which were laced right down to the toe. Mm. Um, and I said, it's 1934. And of course that gave him something. To, the, the, and you know, I was way out of it. And then there was a sort of a swirl. And then another image came into my mind where this chap, who was also somehow me, but not me, because I was observing him. But uh, as you'll, you'll, you'll hear that the, I was also sort of feeling through him. Um, but the, because the, well, the, the, the scene now was um, sort of traveling rugs on, on, a, on, a, on a lawn. There was a cricket match sort of going on in the background. There were, there were uh, girls in, in sort of sort of frilly dresses. What we call old fashioned dresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1934 Boys dresses. Boys in, no, no, oh. 1914 dresses. Oh. And chaps in boaters and what have you. And, the, uh, and, and, and I said it's 1914. And, they, and then, then uh, Felix said, um, um, I, 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 are you involved? And, and my voice changed entirely. It became much more youthful at the time. And I started using really rather archaic languages, you know, language and, yeah, and yeah, the way yeah, I was yeah, describing yeah. things. Expressions from the Edwardian of, times. Or, or, yeah, sort of Bertie Worcester, sort of, yeah. not, not quite, but mm. the, uh, um, and yeah, we're, we're, we've all signed up and we're going to France. Mm. Um, how do you feel about that? Oh, it'll, be, it'll all be finished by Christmas, and the, yeah. the, the, um, all this sort of thing. Um, so that was it, that, but I was deep into it now, you know, and the, uh, so then he said, move on a year and, um, and this was the most devastating thing. This, this same chap who was also sort of me, he was sitting on a horse at a, a, a T junction somewhere in France, dust, dust, dust everywhere. And, the, um, and there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of troops sort of filing past, you know, shambling rather than marching mm, in, in, mm, in regular mm. order. And he was sitting on this horse and he was sort of slumped like that. And my voice completely changed. And it was so tired so tired and for the rest of this this experience the um he never lost that terrible tiredness the he it, it was not clear what but obviously a lot had happened during that the 12 months um that he'd been at the western front but the the um and, and i i didn't have any visions of of the ghastliness of the trenches or anything like mm -hmm. that but just this this snapshot of him there and this incredibly tired voice and i remember there was some, some question you know, or it doesn't matter, but the, so then move on six months. Uh, image now was a, an, a, a sort of canvas awning against a, 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 like a rough farmhouse wall, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, here he was, he's lying on a truckle, a truckle bed, like a camp bed with, with you know, the, the wooden cross, cross things, legs, you know? yeah. and there was a nurse and there was a lamp and the, um, you know, a paraffin lamp. Um, and a nurse who was, who was reading a book or doing knitting or something like that, and he was lying there. And I'd been wounded, I say I, you see, I'm, I'm mm. sort of there. Mm. And, the, mm. uh, um, and how, how he's badly wounded. And I always remember the phrase that I replied, I said, uh, not badly, but I think it's a blighty, enough to get me back to, to UK. So then the next scene was, was, on, was like a kind of veranda and there was sort of parkland, um, and there were, the, I was in a, in, a, in a bath chair and was wrapped mm -hmm. in rugs, and, the, uh, and sitting on this veranda, and there were, there were other people in a similar sort of mm -hmm. condition, just mm -hmm. looking out over this, over this park. And then the next one, move on, um, was just a glimpse of this fellow diving naked over a headland, and I knew we were now back in Cowell, in Knapdale, um, uh, and that was all, just the, the just the, he was diving into the sea from a, from a, from a headland. Um, and then the next one after that um, was the, this chap wrapped up in, 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 a very, in a narrow kitchen with a black range and, uh, and a woman there who was not his wife, looked a bit like a housekeeper or a maid of some sort mm -hmm. and, and giving him tea or whatever. And, um, and I knew that what had happened was that with his gammy leg, um, 
he had had difficulty taking his clothes off to have a swim, and then he'd had difficulty climbing back up to get his clothes, and he'd caught, you know, I, well, I don't know whether it was pneumonia or, or a, bad, a bad chill, because mm. the final image was the, uh, he was lying in a bed, um, and there was, he was lying in a bed, and there was a fire burning, a small fire in the bedroom at the, at the head of the bed, um, and then there was a window over here. The, the whole, each, each of these images was so vivid. Well, the so fact that vivid. you can recall them, you are now well, I know. a lot older than you were when you were a yeah, student. Yeah, well, this would be in 1977 yeah. when, when, when this happened. Yeah. Um, and this sad, sad voice that, that, that never, ever recovered any of its, any of its joy and, mm. and, and, and so on. Um, it was the most extraordinary thing. And then, then the, 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 they said, and this has gone on for about two hours, I should think, and the... Uh, um, uh, and then they said, are you ready to, to come back down to earth? And I said, yeah. Because I could see, so at some periods, the, 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 the questions were coming from a great distance. Mm. Some questions, they were, but I was, I was coming out of it now. Mm. Um, and of course, the other thing, I thought, this is, yippee, this is, this is reincarnation. This is mm. all this stuff. Mm. It, it didn't seem like it for me, you know. I, I did feel that the, I felt as if I'd been, in a funny way, put through the First World War. Um, yes, yes. But it was really, for me, it was, and I'd love to hear from anybody else who's had a similar experience, the, uh, it was really more an exercise in concentration, you know. Um, the, the, uh, thinking about it later, nothing, even it's a blighty, you know, the, not, all my language was, mm. was um, I could have read, I could have seen in films, I mm. could have, whatever, mm. it mm. was not mm. necessarily um, original. You know. But you were concentrating on another person who had a credible biography. Well, that's the, the, the interesting thing is that the, the, there was this relationship with this person because I was watching him, I was, but he, he was like an extension of me or something. I don't yes. know how you'd account for that. That sounds like reincarnation, an extension of you, because I don't think that the very good reincarnation evidence shows that one person becomes another person. Mm -hmm. It shows that children have strong memories of previous lives to which they are clearly connected and some part of the previous person is present in the child who grows up and forgets it and lives his own life. Really? It's not yeah. a one-to-one -one fit. It's something more that in the, on the spirit side of things, if it exists, there is um, a fluidity between different people and they can, they can relate to each other in different ways and they can be different people at different times. And apparently the more spiritually advanced you get, the more fluid you, you become. And the very top of that pyramid would be, you realize the universal consciousness, there is only one of us, which yes, would be the yes. extreme point. So if you come right back down to where you were, parts of him, as it were, projections of him could be connected to you either through ancestry. I mean, after all, it was near where you lived that you, mm. I mean, you weren't there at the time, you were in Edinburgh, but you could do come from Aaron, and even if mm. you didn't know where Knapdale was, it is in fact just the other mm. side of the water. And it's the right generation for someone who obviously could have had a bad time in the First World mm. War and thus be um, reincarnated in part or projected in part into your mind on this occasion. So you don't have to go the full reincarnational hog. But I think just saying concentration is, is a bit limited. I mean, I could concentrate until every cow in the world came home, and I don't think I'd think of myself as a man with funny boots walking up Natdale. <laughs> you know? Yes, I know. I know. Well, it, I mean, it was a very moving experience. Of the, course, the, you, the, you still remember uh, it, and you, you still tell <clears> it with animation, that story. I mm. mean, I, I hear you reliving it as people who have NDEs relive things, or I relive my, my golden moments. Mm, mm. I mean, I'm not quite sure that I can cap that. I'm not sure this is totally competitive, Charlie. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, I could bring us absolutely down to earth, if you like, and go out to the very bottom, but still in the spiritual realm. I don't know whether you like this one. Um, you know the London Underground? Mm -hmm. Well, I get the sense of being stared at. And my friend Rupert Sheldrake has, has a book written called The Sense of Being Stared At and other things that, you know, demonstrate that there is something paranormal. That isn't really the subtitle. Um, and Sheldrake says that we do get it and that it is paranormal. And I get it quite a lot. And he says in his book... You just sense whether it's happening or not. Yes. I mean, do you, do you then turn around oh, quickly? And it's always happening. Yeah. Yeah. But I sense it. I mean, I remember when I was a young... Um, lecturer at Stirling University, I was wandering around somewhere on the campus and a woman with a pram was going past on the other side of the road and I would clocked her as you clock anybody in front of you at some distance away and as it were dismissed her from my 
realm of interests and was pondering my next lecture or something, and I was just looking and going forward. And as she got to about here, it was as if someone had seized my chin, and I'm not going to do it because I've hurt my neck, but I, you know, boom, she pulled me right across, and I looked across at her, and she was looking at me, which she hadn't been thither to, I don't think. And that was one of many, many examples. Anyway, Rupert Sheldrake says you can test it. If you go into the London Underground, what you need to do is to take a book and you get a seat, if you can, don't try the Northern Line. <laughs> you, 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 you sit down and you start reading your book. Just do that. That's all you have to do. And at a certain point, it may happen to you, and it has frequently happened to me, that you will suddenly look up. Now, there will be perhaps within your range of vision eight people or whatever it is sitting opposite you, but you won't scan you look straight at the person who's looking at you. And you so can see strange. that none of the others is. Now, that's a very good test. Sheldrake is extremely good at devising tests. That's a very good test because if it's just, well, I'm glancing up and, oh, well, yes, I'm there. Oh, he's looking at me. That would be one thing. But of but course, you could do it the other way around and test it from, by looking penetratingly oh, yes. at somebody Absolutely. else and see if they yes. look Yes, I've up. only once had success doing that. <laughs> and, and when it's done in a laboratory, and I have to say, the difficulty with all these spiritual things is that they don't obey the same rules as we have here. And the result is that when they're tested by ordinary scientific, this world, rules, such as in laboratories, they, they tend to fizzle out and reduce to very little. And the sceptics say, oh, well, there you are, they're not real then. But that's only if you believe that only scientific things are real. What actually is happening is that uh, all those spiritual possibilities inside ourselves and inside spirit, if it exists, are activated spontaneously, not under lab conditions. Yeah. But it is still true that under lab conditions, people can, for example, alter the production of numbers in a random num number generator. Merely, if you get a group of 10 people staring at a random number generator and ask them to, to go for, um, let's say, more even numbers than odd numbers, after a while, the random number generator, which is only a machine, will. So even in lab conditions, you can get something, and there are other such experiments. But this one, anybody could do. And of course, I won't go into it in detail, but Rupert Sheldrake is also the man who wrote the book called Dogs, know who, Dogs who Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Ah, and yes. he has completely demonstrated for yeah. sure yeah. that they do. And people yeah. always say, you know, when you tell them that, they always say, oh, but I expect you always come home at the same time. And no. do you think that Rupert Sheldrake with an IQ of 150 and two PhDs hadn't thought of that? You know, yeah. anyway, sorry, yeah. I get rather heated about that one. Um, but of course he had, and he, he, he had double blind and all the rest of it. And it's quite clear that your doggy will know when you're coming mm. home if you mm. have a good relationship mm. with him, mm. and, there's, and there's no doubt about that. And of course, he, um, Sheldrake, oh, I'm, I'm not, I should be telling my own stories, shouldn't I? Well, this is my own story. Sheldrake also proposes that um, you, you know who is phoning sometimes when they phone. You just know. Oh, yeah. All the time. Well, all the time. He tried the Nolan sisters. You remember the singers? Nolan yes, sisters. yes, indeed. He got them all in, and they were all game. And they had to say who was phoning as they all phoned each other from the other room. And they were well above average. But I had that um, some years ago. I was living in France, and uh, I was in my garden. And I'd put my um, mobile phone uh, away on a wall. And um, I always kept my mobile phone near me because I had two daughters of school age back in England, and I always thought, or Scotland in fact, and I always thought it'd be a good idea to be present whenever they phoned me. So I knew where it was, but it was some distance from me. And I was digging something or moving a stone, and I suddenly felt myself stand up straight and begin to run towards my mobile phone at maximum speed. Dum, 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 dum. Before it was even wrong. No noise at all from the mobile phone. And I arrived at the mobile phone thinking, Miranda, 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 the name of my younger daughter. Mm. Mm. And there, on the screen, came mm. the name Miranda, and she rang, and I said, I was expecting you, darling. I think he's right. I think the Nolan Sisters experiment demonstrates it. I think dogs and people know things about other people which are paranormal or not possible from any other point of view. I mean, how do you, do you you've obviously experienced a little bit of that yourself. Oh, I mean, I mean yeah, Joe, my, my PA, um, you know, she, she, and she, at random times of the day, I mean, she, she doesn't do well, uh, 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 since we're all locked down, she, she doesn't come here anymore, but the, um, or occasionally, but, but the, when the phone goes and I just have it, you since, I'm, or, yeah. I'm a, or I'm about to phone her. Yes. And so she'll phone me a couple of times a day just to report on emails and things like that. So I mean, it's very familiar with, uh, certainly with Joe, but with other people and sometimes very surprising people who, 
you haven't heard from for, for a long time and suddenly you, you, you think, oh, I think I need to phone Mike or whatever it is. Yes, yes. And then lo and behold, later that day or... or they the phone you half, or... They, or yes, they, yes. They, they phone. It's, it's a very odd thing. The mention of telephones reminds me of a curious thing that I heard quite recently actually from a very, very, very old friend mm. concerning his cousin. Now, the cousin was called Dermot Campbell and he lived in Argyllshire, up in Argyll. And he had a brother called Connell who lived in Edinburgh. And uh, Dermot was um, sort of pottering around, actually was sitting at his desk in the, the, his wee house in, um, in Argyll. And um, when suddenly, I don't know if there was a knock on the door or suddenly Connell appeared, just like that. He says, Connell, he gets up and he says, Connell, how nice to see you, you know, why didn't you phone me? I'd have baked a cake, you know, I'd have got, I'd got um, you know, prepared for you. And, and, he, and Connell, who is palpable, you know, he, he's, he's, he's real, mm. you know, all he says is, tell Kitty that everything is all right. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure that I've got the name right, but, but his wife's, his wife, wife's yeah, name, yeah. you know. And... Um, he said, well, why, why, why? And then the telephone rang. That's why I was reminded of it. And so he turns to pick up the telephone from the table or from the desk. And this is Kitty telling him that Connell had just had a massive heart attack and died in the kitchen in Edinburgh. Whoa. Yes. And then he turns back. Connell's not there. Gone. Yeah. Wow. But he was not, so, he, I mean, he was delighted to see him. He was not, not there was no phantasm or anything mm -hmm. like that. He, was he a thought real, it was Connell. A real person. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of, of, of stories like that. I'm sure the, there are. I mean, it, it's actually, I, mean, I won't say it's common, but I mean, there's a really astonishing number. Um, but I myself, only two days ago, was, was sitting in a, in a, in a group um, in which some aspect of the other side was invited to come in. And you know that my brother died last year. Yes, um, yes. In, da, da, down in Dorset. And he was totally sceptical and very negative about all this kind of thing. Mm. And I got some sort of a message from one of the sitters, oh, your brother is standing you know, behind your right shoulder, and, and he's saying, and I can't quite remember what words she used, but it was something to the effect of, you know, this is, uh, you know, I, I see what you mean now. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> what, what you want to hear from your elder brother, of course. Anyway, now, you know, Gosh. and that's just one of many, many appearances. Um, my friend Peter Fenwick has written a, written a book called, uh, which is about end of life experiences, ELEs, as he calls them, in this acronym ridden area, you know, NDEs, mm, OBEs, mm, e ELEs. Mm. And the end of life experiences are really quite common within the first six weeks, and certainly the first six months of a mm, death. Mm. People who love that person getting some form of message, either a smell or a sound or a sight, you know, that happens a lot. And you only have to talk to nurse in, nurses in the ICU or nurses in hospices, and they're, they're full of such things. I mean, we heard someone the other day telling us that um, a friend of theirs who was a nurse, they used to say, they used to know um, when someone was going to die in the hospice because the, the someone dying um, used to say, oh, we Jimmy visited me today. This would be some sort of six-year-old boy or, 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 or someone from their past or whatever it was, you know, who'd, who'd either regressed in time or w w died young. And they, they'd see them. And when they told the nurses that they'd seen someone in their room who wasn't really there, as it were, the nurses knew that they would die pretty soon thereafter, and they did. Good. So these Lord. visits. And, but my, did, and did, they, did the, the, the inmates, the patients, know about this wee Jimmy, that would, this, this uh, little boy that would appear? Uh, you mean the, the patient, the, the one patient, or all the patients? All, all the patients. No, I don't think so. So they, they no. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the so they just reported that that a small boy or yeah, whatever it was. Yes, had, that's right, had, yes. Had, had, um, and you know, this, this sort of stuff is becoming better known because in the television play, the Sopra television series, The Sopranos, there's an extraordinary, you know, David Chase who made it, he's clearly an open-minded man because there are several episodes in The Sopranos and it's a pretty hard-hitting, you know, mafia cop show sort of thing. Um, but there, when Johnny Sack, one of the godfathers, dies in hospital of cancer, prison hospital, I think, of cancer, um, the last thing he does is go, Mom? You know, clearly he's seeing his mother who's long yeah. since dead because yeah. he's a 70 year old yeah. man or whatever it is. So, I mean, I'm saying that not because The Sopranos is a, is a, a point of reference, but it shows that, that we, people are beginning to accept that these sort of things are a bit easier. Yeah. Coming, coming down to earth, um, 
I, I like to tell a brief story as we finish this whiskey and think about the next one, um, <laughs> that I was, I was quite depressed in the year 2000. I was having a bit of a bad time. And someone told me that I should go and see Trond. And Trond, as you can imagine, if you know the fact there's a Norwegian town called Trondheim, um, was a Norwegian. He was a Norwegian healer. And I, had, I was in London and I went to Hampstead where Trond was staying with someone and was seeing people who wanted to see him. And Trond was six foot five, he had grey eyes and he was wearing a leather jacket and jeans and he came in to the room and he said, I'm sorry to be a little slow, um, I, I, I was out in the garden smoking a spliff. So I thought, what have I got on my hands here? You know, this sort of giant standing next to me, sort of reeking of marijuana. And he said, I said, who are you? And he said, well, I, I'm a, uh, they, they call me a healer, but I'm really a warrior monk. So at this point, I thought, you know, I'd been had, because I think I was going to have to give him 50 quid for the pleasure of this encounter. Anyway, he could see, obviously, he could intuit that I was mm. a bit sceptical about him. So he said, well, before we begin, I'd like you to go and sit in that chair. And he pointed to an armchair, a dining chair, you know, carver, like this, which was looking from the drawing room where we were, out through a huge bay window into the st leafy street of, of Hampstead. And so I went and sat there, and he stood some distance behind me in this big room and said and did nothing. And I had absolutely no consciousness of anything other than the fact that I was... So you were looking out of the window? I was looking out of the window. And he was looking at the back of your head? Correct. And I thought, well, this is 50 quid well spent, you know, <laughs> because I was just sitting in a chair. Anyway, quite quickly, I had a memory of my father, who was an army officer, and who used to say to myself and my brother, sit up straight at dinner, or when we were at our desks, or whatever it is, sit up, come on, sit up straight, stand up straight. You know? And I've always had a bit of a thing about standing up straight. And this vision of my father coincided with the desire I had to sit up straight. Yes. Which I did. And then I thought, that's not good enough. What I need to do is to get my feet back and I can't do it with this chair, but I got my feet round the front feet of the chair. And then I thought, that's not enough. And I got my head back as far as that. And then I thought, that's not really good enough. And I got my arms further back and I joined my hands behind. And within a couple of minutes, I was in agony, absolute agony, because my legs and my arms were pressing back and my head was pressing back. And oh God, you know, I was like this, it would be sort of murdered or something. Whereupon, for the first time, he made a noise in this five-minute period. He went, okay, and I went, like this. Oh, and he said, you know, I have to be careful, because, you know, you could be standing on the platform of the underground. The underground comes into a lot of my stories. You're standing on the platform of the underground, and you see your enemy on the other side, and the train is coming in, and you go, come along then, come along then, and he falls in front of the train. <laughs> <laughs> And it was true, because it wasn't hypnosis. Oh, I was not hypnotised, there was no way he could have hypnotised me. And he then did several other things, like telling me I had an enormous black lump sticking out of my head that he would improve, and that, that it was my depression. And he did several other things. As I was saying goodbye, he said, watch this. And he took my hand, he said nothing, he didn't move. And I went, <laughs> like that. He said, okay, goodbye. Uh, okay, and I left. Just those grey eyes, bam. Well, you know, this is not proof of the existence of God. No, no, you know? no. But it's that large world of the paranormal, which is, of course, completely ignored by scientific materialism, of which just you and I, just two chaps, have many examples. Mm. Yeah, we and many, 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 many others. Many, many other know. people. And, and as, I mean, I'm not involved, as you know, in, in this, although I'm, I'm, I'm very, very interested, and my interest has been rekindled. Whatever happened to that chap, the Norwegian fellow? I never heard from him again. Mm. I mean, I thought I, I felt I'd done my thing with him and he'd done his thing with me. Mm. And I always talk about him, but... but I, had, I had an experience meeting someone like that yeah. um, in the University of Oxford. I was never at Oxford University, but for some reason, I can't remember why I was there visiting somebody. And I, I met this fellow. He was, um, um, well, I suppose he was a Zoro Zoroastrian. And wow. so he was probably Syrian, I would guess, or... Well, Persian, but Iranian, or yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was the one of the most ast extraordinary people. That it, rather like your your, he wasn't massively tall, but when he looked at you, you 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 really felt he looked into your soul. You know, 
And he would say very politely, what is your interest in this? And I said, well, I, I, I studied divinity in St. Andrews University. I've got some passing interest in these things. And you, and you, you, you just know that he said, this guy's a complete tosser. <laughs> <laughs> what does he know? Yeah. You know. And the, um, but he, he'd had an extraordinary career from, from, from the, he, 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 he was very, very high up in the Zoroastrian church, the, the Parsis. Parsis, and yeah. the, uh, um, and the and his his education had been very carefully, carefully controlled by his mother, particularly, and her advisors. And so, I think he he had he'd completed a degree in 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 um, well, presumably um, well in, in the in the Middle East. I'm, I'm not sure it wasn't in India, as a matter of fact. Well, Parsis are actually I in think Bombay. They, yeah, that's yes, right. Although they are the remains so of I, So I think he may have been. I think he may have been. A, a, a Parsi, Bombay uh, Parsi, yeah, yeah that's you know. right. Yeah. And um, because in the Iran, age, they kill you for being a Zoroastrian. So. Oh, oh, do they? Do they now? Well, they kill you for practically anything. Yeah. Being gay, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, that's of course, yeah. So yes, he would have been. He would have been. He would have been Parsi Indian. Yeah. And the, uh, um, and so he done a degree. Um, and then he'd been sent to sit at the feet of a guru in the in the Himalayas. For about five years to, to develop the spiritual side of his character. Um, and then they thought that had got a little bit out of kilter with the materialistic side of it. So he'd set, he was sent to London. And I'm not sure he didn't qualify as a chartered accountant or something mm -hmm. like that. And now that had been finished, and now he'd been sent to Oxford. And he was writing a doctoral thesis on um, prayer patterns, alpha wave patterns, and things, the scientific in the study brain. Of, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. And, um, and, and one of the things he told me, I remember, was that the, um, you know, the, the, it is remarkable because he, he would give, he would give this, the, the, the sample group um, a, a, a Parsi prayer, um, which they didn't understand. Um, and the, the, but they had to, they, they pronounced it. And then he would say, what, what for you, what does it, what does it, what, what does it, what does it say to you? Short mm. prayer. And the, uh, something like 70% got it pretty well right. Oh, you know, really? Even though I mean, they didn't quite, understand the language. They didn't understand the language. But for their, for their, their you know, the, the interest. But he also said, the, um, I could take you f f f five minutes walk from here. Um, and if I could get you to stand, like taking photographs, to stand in a particular point, point for, for, and he knew he was into all sorts of the, the earth. Ley lines, um, lay lines and, things, and stuff yeah, yeah. like that. If I could get you to stand on that particular point for, let's say, five minutes, You'd be physically sick, and the uh, I mean, I mean, and it, I mean, he was, but he was such an impressive character. Mm -hmm. you, you, you believed him, as it Absolutely. were. Absolutely, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. But that kind of um, that kind of power over power over other people. Um, some people would say, you know, they, they they reach for hypnosis. I have to say, there is no explanation for no. hypnosis. It is also a paranormal thing, although it's so common and, and can be done in a, in a theatre for, for money, so people don't regard it seriously. But it is completely paranormal. Mm. But anyway, mm. they, they dismiss it as, as 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 merely that. But the power, other powers, seem more convincing if less dramatic. Um, you perhaps heard the story of the, I think it was a Scottish this year, a Scottish school mistress, school head teacher who asked her kids, when they came into school every morning, to be nice to one of the pot plants in the hall and to be horrid to the other pot plant no, in the I hall, heard right? This. No, well, they were, they were in the same place, the same temperature, they were watered just as often, they were identical plants from the identical plant nursery, but she was trying an experiment. And they all had to come in, these poor little kids, and say, hello, lovely plant, and gosh, you're a horrible plant, we don't like you. And when I picked oh, this no. up somewhere, on, somewhere on, on, online, there was a photograph of the two plants. And one of them was going, hey, I'm a terrific plant, and guess which one that was. And the other one was going, I am practically dead, and was about half the size, oh, and going brown. No, so really? we have power over things that we know not what, yes, you know, what of, yes, you know. Yes. Um, and even, well, the Prince uh, of Wales was lampooned for talking to flowers or whatever, many, yes, many, many yes, years ago. Yes. But he's a wise bird. And he's the, a wise bird the, in that the, respect, I certainly uh, think. Yeah. And I mean, John McManaway up in Fife, the son of Hot Hands McManaway, the famous healer from the Second World War, who all the wounded troops 
in, in Europe as they are after D-Day wanted to have Major McManaway um, on, on, on their patrol, you know, because if Major McManaway touched you, you survived, and, it, and, and if you didn't, you didn't. You know, that was their mythology, but there was some truth in it. Anyway, his sons have all become healers, I think, and they're, they're in Fife and elsewhere. And, and the one I know best, John McManaway, who I have to say is another incredibly tall man. Why am I obsessed by this press? Because I'm so short. Um, who's six foot seven. Um, uh, John McManaway uh, makes his living curing incurable bulls. <laughs> bulls are extremely valuable animals. Mm. And he has managed to go all around Scotland just getting near bulls and talking to them when they're in terminal states and making them Gosh. revive. And he then receives the check for that. Now, do you think it is That's easy to part an Aberdeenshire farmer yeah. from 200 quid yeah. for magically curing a bull? I mean, chance is absolutely zero, yeah. and yet he does. So someone thinks that he's doing something, and the bulls certainly yeah. do, because they get better. Yeah. So we have these powers, well, or rather, he has. Yeah. And what the really annoying thing about all these healers and, 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 and you know, clairvoyance and pre cognitive people is that they always say, well, we've all got those powers, you know, yeah, you've got I them know. as well. And you're left there thinking, well, I think I'll just go out for a drink. <laughs> I'm sure I haven't got any, yeah, but know. perhaps we all do. There was, a, there was a famous story. He was called the Water Mani of, uh, it was up near, it was uh, Glengarry to Surrey in Aberdeenshire. Yeah. And he was a water diviner. Oh, yes. The Water Mani. Well, that's for real, for sure. And the, 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 the uh, Oh, the distillery was always underperforming. There was never enough water, and the water was not 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 very good. And so, the, the it was to be sold. And the um, this was going back to the 1960s. And the um, it was bought by Stanley um, Morrison, and who owned Bomore Distillery, Glengarry, the distillery. And the uh, he employed the water mani, and the uh, and he found a, a not far away perfect source of water. And the, so the, the, they were able to increase production and, and, and improve the quality of the, of the spirit massively by this guy Just dowsing. along with, with yeah. dowsing. Yeah. 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 yeah, I hope they gave him a cut. I would hope so. Well, I, don't, I don't know, but he's probably quite happy, but you would have it with the, with the check, or indeed probably in those days, probably a supply a supply, supply of whiskey. Supply for, yeah. for the dowsing. I mean, I think people know that's right. I mean, mm. serious firms and engineers and explorers and people have definitely used dowsers mm. I mean, yes, for absolutely. hundreds of years to, to, to find things, and they do, you mm. know. Have we got time for another whiskey? Oh, I think just one more, Because yes. I've got, I've got you've, your, your story about the, the, or the stories about the dowsing is, has reminded me of another truly extraordinary spiritual, if you like, story relating yeah. to Glenrothes Distillery up in, in, in Rothes, Speyside. Oh, yes. You see, this is somewhat darker, Lance. Yes, the, uh, yes. This is, this is almost certainly European oak maturation, so it's ex, ex sherry casks. Ah, yes, the, of uh, course, yes. More tannic, and so therefore it gives this darker colour. Um, it's 2008, so that's, it's not a terribly old whisky, mm. but it's got a bit of age. But my story relates to Glenrothes Distillery, which is in Rothes on Speyside. Um, so it's, it's not the same as this one, but it's not far away. And the, uh, let's have a tram first. Let's have a get a sludge. Mm. 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 Very nice. Um, Glenrothes was dramatic. They built a new still house in 1989 and um, put in some more stills but the, there was an awful lot of copper and so on expanded the still house and they built actually a whole new still house and then soon after that the operators especially on night shift began to see a figure in the corner of the, the still house and they knew exactly who it was because he was a black man and he was called Baiwe Makalanga, and he had, they knew him as a boy. I mean, the, but you see, he'd been dead since 1976, and the um, and he was a well, well-known figure in in Roth, a well-loved what they what they call a worthy, you know. And he had been brought out of Africa by Major James Grant of Glen Grant Distillery, who was a great hunter in the 1890s. Mm. And they were they had been hunting whatever it was they were hunting lions or whatever and the in Makalanga province which is in Matabili land in Africa and there had been some local trouble sort of tribal feuds or whatever and they found these two little waifs these little tiny children 
by the, uh, by the, by the wayside. Um, they found relations of one of them, but not of the other. And so um, uh, James, um, the major, as he was always known, brought him back to Scotland. Mm. And he called him Byway, by the wayside, Macalanga. Oh, nice Macalanga name, yes, yes, yes. And he raised him there in, in, in Glen Grant House, and um, he became his sort of um, butler, you mm. know, his, and, the, uh, and he was very keen on, for, he out outlived, the major died in the 1930s, um, and um, by the way, was carried on, and the, so he, he, was a, he was a passionate supporter of the Roths Football Club, and when the major died, he gave instructions that the, uh, that, the, which, he, that he should get, he should always have his room in, in Glen Roth's house, he should get a meal every day in the in the local hotel, get his coal for for his fire from the distillery, and so on. Made made sure he was he was mm. looked after. Great. But as I say, he was a well loved character, and so they all knew who he was, and so they weren't afraid. But you know, he'd been dead for for, for <laughs> thirteen years. <laughs> oh, <you know. laughs> so the story came to the ears of um, a professor. He was a he was called Cedric Brown, and I think he his his. He, he was he was a professor of something something not related to not philosophy or divinity mm. or anything, mm. in, in Trinity College Dublin, I'm very interested in the paranormal, and he he applied to the board of Highland Distilleries, which owned Glenrothes, um, to research, and the chap that I heard the story from was the guy that had been he was the master blender as a matter of fact for Highland, um, who had had was deputed to look after the professor, and they went up to the distillery. And he went round with the, the, the old dowsing rods and he, he, he said, oh, I'll tell you what's happened here. With all this new copper and stuff, you've created a kink in a ley line which runs from Rothes Castle, ruinous, to Plus Pluscadon on, oh. the, on, the, on, the, on the Mary Firth. Mm. And, the, um, and it's this kink. Why on earth, um, by way, who was not connected to to mm. to Rothes, Glen Rothes Distillery mm. should have been up, but he Rothes of the the local graveyard right and so there's some very old graves there rises up and he's buried in there so it, he's almost the grave almost All overlooks the that, 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 yeah. that still house oh, yes, yes. and so maybe he poor soul was being disturbed by it um, but he appeared in the distillery from time to yeah, time yeah 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 just just after the the opening of the of the of the new the new still house mm. and the um, so the Professor Brown went round with his dowsing rods and he said, well, you know, I tell you what, you're going to find you'll get much better performance out of number six wash still or whatever. If you, you need to locate some, get some pig iron, get an old, uh, old tractor engine or something and bury it in the ground. It's a bit like, you can imagine like, like um, you know, acupuncture pins. Yes, yeah, but um, for the earth. To, to, yeah. And and you 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 they they wasn't they weren't even aware that the, 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 this still was not performing apparently, um, as it should do, um, but they they followed his advice somewhat reluctantly. Actually, Holland they, they they didn't want this this story to be known at all. Of course. And then um, he went up into the graveyard and he came back about twenty minutes later and he said, "You won't hear anything more from from Byway." So but by the way, did did the decent buy them? Yeah, they? Sort and, of. And, and they improved the, yeah. the whiskey. Yeah, but but by the way, was happy then. Uh, yeah, that's completely apparently. wonderful. And it's rather marvellous that I mean, in the Highlands in those days, very few black men. So yeah. a, a vague ghost is not a vague ghost under yeah. those circumstances. Yeah. It's a very specific person. That, that that's yes, quite good. Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I might. We're going to have to stop soon, Charlie. But mm. I, I thought I just might try. I can't quite cap that. But the village I was born in in, in North Dorset was wiped out um, in the Black Death and has never recovered. But we, I was born in Silton House, called Silton, the, the parish. I was born in Silton House. And our great friends and, and rivals, uh, and not really, were the Longfields who lived in Lower Silton House on the other side of the parish. And they were really the only two sort of half decent houses um, there. And Colonel Jim Longfield, who'd fought a gallant war as my father and uncle also had done, and uh, eventually died, and his widow didn't want to keep on um, Lower Filton House. And so it was bought. And it was bought by a man known in the village and widely around as the Bastard. <laughs> yeah. And the Bastard was a sort of self-made bloke who'd, you know, collected a pile of brass and, and, and come down to Dorset for a nice sort of comfortable retirement to play the squire in the country. And he was an absolute so-and-so and everybody absolutely hated him. 
One year after his having bought this beautiful house and sort of settled down there to retire, he sold it. He left, he sold it. And questions were asked as to why he would do so so soon. And eventually he confessed, the bastard confessed, why he had left Sil Lower Sultan House. And the answer was that he couldn't stand being visited at night by Colonel Jim Longfield. Now definitely dead, Colonel Jim Longfield would pitch up and say, you're a bastard. <laughs> he couldn't cope with it much longer. How extraordinary. And he bugger now, I mean, it's rather like my John McManaway, you know, persuading Aberdeenshire farmers mm. to allow him to go and stand next to bulls. Mm. And then they get better and they, you know, the proof is that they pay him. And so similarly here, I mean, no one was expecting a ghost of nice Colonel Jim. Mm. The Colonel Jim just didn't like this guy who'd bought his house at post-mortem and decided that he'd just chase him away. Mm. <laughs> but you know, you, oh, well, that's and that, I hadn't heard that story. That's that's a, that's a lovely story. But yeah. the, it it really brings to the conclusion that the the uh, you know whether you believe so-called believe in ghosts mm. or not is irrelevant. But you have to accept the fact that people see ghosts. Yes. And so, yes. what is it they see? We don't Another know. Another question. But yeah. And the uh, but, well, that, that, but that's, that's a great place to end on because my thesis now, and the thing I'm trying to push really among all the things we do in the Arthur Conan Doyle Centre, is to hope to get us over the hump. And the hump is this: there was a time quite recently when most ordinary thinking people who weren't very interested in this stuff really tried to say that ghosts or near-death experiences, one way or another, didn't happen. Mm. I think we're past that hump. We're not at the point where everybody believes they happen and we all know how to deal mm. with them, not mm. at all. But we're over the hump in that everybody now thinks, well, they happen, but what do they mean? Mm. Now, that's a huge step that's forward. Great. That's great. And I think it's better. I mean, even if it turns out that it's all a trick of the light mm. or, or it's all something to do with our brains, that's fine. Mm. Mm. But mm. it's better than people saying, well, we have mm. 20 million, we now have 20 million recorded um, near-death experiences. Good Lord, many and, is that? I mean, you've got a lot of people wearing blindfolds saying, they didn't happen, they didn't happen. That's hopeless. Mm. No one could go on like that. Mm. Now they're saying, well, what do they mean? That's a much better question, and that's mm. the question which we're asking about all our stories, mm. really, in a way. Yeah. And, and, they are, and the solution must be that they have some meaning, whatever mm. it is. Mm. And I think that the... The, my general feeling from, from my impressions is that this is this, and, and talking to you, um, it's very hopeful. Yes. The, the, it's, it's indeed even joyous. Yes. You know, so the, the, the more we find out about this whole mysterious area, the, uh, the, the happier we'll be, I the more comforted agree. we'll be. I've certainly become um, happier and happier in the last few years. Yeah. And I feel like Raymond Moody, who is the man who wrote Life After Life, which was the first book on near-death experiences in 1975. I saw him interviewed on television the other day. Lovely old American he is now. Well, he always was an American, but he's now old. And he said to the interviewer, I want to say something to you. What do you want to say, Raymond? And Raymond said, you know, I've been doing this for 45 years, or whatever it was, you know. And you know what's happened? What's happened? I'm beginning to believe it. <laughs> I really think it happens. So that was Raymond, same sort of age as me, happy to die, as, in a way, I am. Mm. Mm. Well, on that sad note... <laughs> <laughs> well, we can have another drink before I go, you know. God bless Goodbye. you. God bless Sorry. you. Mm.